My name is Randy Moore, and it is a, an immense pleasure to be here with two people whom I greatly respect, have known for over 10 years in many capacities. And um, boy, do we have a lot of great things in store for you all over this next hour. And I'm holding in my hand, as well as in the background, uh, the book that you all need to go out and get right now. And it is called Working to Learn, Disrupting the Divide Between College and Career Pathways for Young People. It is my pleasure to welcome and introduce to you Drs. Noel Anderson and Dr. Lisette Nieves. So I'm going to snap it up for you all. <laughs> and, um, you know, so just to read uh, just a, a, a quick a snippet of both of their bios, and I'd be here forever if I... Uh, uh, highlighted all of their, their accolades, but uh, starting with Dr. Anderson, he currently holds the position of chairperson uh, of the Department of Administration, Leadership and Technology, and clinical professor of educational leadership and policy studies at New York University Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. Uh, he is responsible for leading and growing undergraduate, graduate, and professional development programs uh, in the areas of education, communication, and technology, educational leadership and policy studies, and higher education administration in New York City, and supporting initiatives within NYU's global campus network. Uh, as you can see, that's a mouthful. Uh, Dr. Anderson has over 25 years of experience in many fields uh, that we're going to touch on today. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to segue into uh, Dr. Lisette Nieves. Dr. Nieves is currently the Director of Educational Leadership and Full Clinical Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at NYU Steinhardt. Uh, Lisette holds a BA from Brooklyn College, a BA and MA from the University of Oxford, uh, an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, and a doctorate with distinction in higher education management at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a Truman Scholar, Rhodes Scholar, and an Aspen Pahara Fellow. Lisette also, similar to Dr. Uh, Anderson, has over 25 years of experience in the field. And with that, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's book talk. So no Noel and Lisette, it is a pleasure to be here with you all today. And I want to hop right into it. I'll, I'll share a little bit more about who I am in a moment. That's not even... That's for your bio in a second. <laughs> yeah, we need your bio. <laughs> we can share a little bit of that. Um, so I'll just give you all a synopsis. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, currently where I am. But my name is Randy Moore, uh, originally from uh, New York City, uh, attended uh, Wilberforce University, which is the first private HBCU in the United States, where I obtained my bachelor's degree uh, in uh, mass media communications and marketing, uh, then uh, obtained my master's at Adelphi University. Uh, in uh, bilingual education uh, and teaching English as a second language and currently pursuing my uh, doctorate in leadership and innovation at Arizona State University. Uh, for the past 15 years, have experience uh, both in the, in the private sector uh, as well as the, the uh, for-profit sector uh, and have um, most recently transitioned from uh, working in philanthropy, where I worked as vice president for post-secondary partnerships and innovation for the James and Duke the Diamond Foundation and the company which uh, they pr provided the seed funding for here to here, and now uh, as chief operating officer uh, for co-op careers, uh, which uh, helps underserved um, first-generation college graduates uh, gain entry into um, the workforce. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with both uh, Noel and Lisette at Year Up, uh, where we've served in various capacities. Um, Y'all put me on the spot there. Happy <laughs> <laughs> really to do it. Awesome. So, you know, as I read this book, I was thoroughly impressed. And one of the things, and I actually wrote it down because I didn't want to forget it, is the fact that this book is very different from many others. You know, sometimes you see the academic approach or the practical approach. And you all really had a braided approach here of scholarship, practice, and policy. Uh, so I first want to commend you all on that. And I would like to ask, you know, what put you two together on this project? What was the impetus for saying, hey, we need to get together and, uh, and put this, this, uh, this literature together? All right. How about you, Noel? Go for it. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, 
you know, the thing about this is that you get a chance to, and thanks again, you know, this is Randy, just to have a chance to talk with you. Um, and Lisa, this is, this is fun. This is a good way to spend the, you know, spend the day. Um, you know, what it came down to is that Lisa and I are working together at NYU, it, and we have a lot to say. We had to do a book. I mean, it's like too much information that's like up here and experience to sort of just let go. So really, it was just sort of the genesis of it was how do we, as you mentioned, blend all those three areas. Um, we, we, we do a lot of work in the field and really sort of felt like professionally there was a reason why we need to get to the folks who at every level are trying to open up opportunity and sort of bridge resources to support people we care most about. Um, and, you know, so that's really the genesis of it. And yeah, you know, it was fun. You know, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. So, you know, I was excited to do it with Lisa. So that's kind of my little story behind it. Lisa, what's yours? Yeah. So also, Randy, so excited to be in this conversation with you and um, just inspired by the work that you do at Co-op and what you've done throughout your career about lifting as you climb, as we say, making sure opportunities available for young people. So thank you. Um, when I think about what brought us together, I think about a few things are the silos that typically do not communicate when we're talking about workforce, we're talking about pathways. We rarely see K-12 connecting or talking to higher ed. We rarely see the economists then talking to both of those. That would be a separate way of reading that. And then the whole piece of proximity. We rarely hear the voices of the young people. And so Noel and I have been able to be very fluid in these different environments. And we felt that, why don't we bring something together? Because we see the connections of this and we know that most people don't necessarily think, as we say, you know, in one direction, they actually might be thinking across these silos. And so that's why we came together on this. And I'm glad that you recognize that in the books. I appreciate that. Yes, thank you both, Lisa and Noel. So um, when you think about your collaboration, what would you say uh, as you all were um, both, you know, providing from your own uh, uh, experiences and, 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 and expertise, but also doing the research, what, what were some of the, the, the um, I like using glows and grows, some of the glows that you experienced doing this work were kind of the aha moments and maybe some of the things that, you know, you noticed as, uh, as areas of growth hmm. in terms of for the field. Oh, wow. That's a that's a that's a hard question, but I love, I love it. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, I, I'm happy to take that one. I'll start on that one. So mm -hmm. I'd say one of the things, and it's fascinating when you when you think about the dissertation work, which rarely do people think about their dissertation. Let's say that they get it and they move on, right? But in some cases. Mm -hmm think about the dissertation work that Noel did, or you think about the dissertation work I did, youth voice was central to that. Youth agency was central to that. Mine was about young adults who were balancing uh, work and school and thinking about that. Noel's was about balancing the multiple context in which young high school students were working in. So when you think about that, there was a piece of it where it was like, wow, We've been talking about this for a long time, and this is really exciting that we can put this. So there was that lifting up of something that we felt was a value already. Um, ironically, not as much of that happens in research that you would think, right? And so, so that was one. I think the part where, um, where it might have been a challenge is that we are confronting these binaries, right? Where people wanna say it's either school or work, right? This whole idea is that it's okay, it's either, um, we're gonna talk about making college for all, so college is gonna be primary. Something always has to be primary. Something always has to be traded away. And that's really not what we're hearing from people. In fact, even people who are workforce people believe, well, well, workforce has to be priority. Or people in school, school has to be priority. We're really pushing back on that and saying, what, why can't we have high academic rigor and high work engagement at the same time, All right? We're really pushing on the silos to do this. This isn't about saying this is good for someone, work isn't good for someone who's in remediation, because then that's the other language, or um, because that's not what we're talking about. Work is good for everyone and it is part of their identity 
that's really important, particularly with the young people that you work with too, first generation, low income students, particularly in my life, I'm sure in Dr. Anderson's life as well too. So there, there are those pieces where I still sometimes get a little frustrated where folks still wanna put us in the box. And we're saying, no, we have to think broader. If we are gonna be innovative, then why do we still hold on to these trade-offs that have not worked, have not worked, right? So that's just my view on that. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, no, it, it you know, just, I mean, Lisa had really kind of just uh, captured kind of what my sentiment is. I mean, I, just to, a couple things to add around the, the whole process of this is, you know, so over the years, really doing research around race and equity and segregated schooling and a bunch of things, you know, and talking to young people, um, I was always fascinated by um, the agency of young people, yes. um, the, the power and agency of young people. And, and what, so, you know, both Lizette and I have, um, uh, you know, our training is in the social sciences, political science, we, we, we revere and respect history um and people's history um and so one of the things that came up which was really salient is that there's always you know democracy with a small d has always been really pushed by the people who are the most on the margins right so the ones who are the, the ones who are left out of the kind of this experiment are the ones who push it and we see that happening now with all that's you know combusting all over the country right now with the deaths and COVID and how we react to it. What I was fascinated by was that we, we had young people who always figured out a way to make something out of nothing, right? So I always say that if you look at it historically, and I use the African-American context, there's always been a way in which we've always bridged this notion around two worlds as, you know, context, you know, I always say work and leisure, right? There was always a way in which we, and it wasn't necessarily anti-capitalist. It was always a way in which we bridged it, right? So, you know, I always say that it was young people who, you know, were teasing each other in hallways and in communities that became rap music, right? Which became the biggest cultural and longest lasting cultural phenomena in the world. Yeah. And we also had, you know, young people, the ones, you know, who were, you know, we see with incarceration, with chain gangs and work songs, that became the blues. So it was always a way in which we were able to leverage the things that we saw we did naturally and make money off of it. But we were the ones who had agency. We pushed the limits of it. We pushed the limits of what culture is. So that's one side of it. That was really kind of what we brought into it. The other thing too is that when we, in the book, we, we realized that so much of our work over these years has been sort of referencing so many models that exist out there nationally and internationally. So, Lizette and I were really focused on getting a deeper understanding of, as we do in education, how we incorporate fads, we incorporate new and hot things, but we very rarely, and I think that's the cult, kind of really the culture of, of the United States, maybe leading innovation when it comes to a lot of different areas, right, and technology and so on. However, when it comes to equity, we don't apply the same kind of lens. So for us, we wanted to look at other programs and see what they're doing with the young people around apprenticeships, for example. And so we said, well, look, they're always touting, you know, the Swiss model or the German model or you name it. And so we said, you know, let's take our resources that we have and let's go abroad and see what this is about. And the revelations in places like Germany, uh, in Sweden, where we visited, uh, really brought home to us that it's uh, when you incorporate models without that ex equity lens, we realize that we may be reifying and continuing the cycle of subjugating groups, right? And not providing opportunity. In this case, you know, we can do that with Latino and African American students in this country when it comes to opportunity through apprenticeships or internships. But we also see the limited opportunities for Syrian refugees, right? For Iraqi refugees or longstanding Turkish immigrant youth or, you know, generational connections to places like Germany and so on. So for us, we, we want the international context to bring that in to show that if we want to lead in innovation, we have to have an equity lens on it. So that became part of the discussion and part of our research and that sent us outside the country. So those are just two other examples. So thank you both so much. I mean, I, I think, you know, you highlighted on points that were really salient to me when reading the text. Um, and also that I, I appreciate both of your mentioning um, 
there's kind of like a, a this this bifurcated system or thinking, right? And and um, when we talk about workforce and we talk about education, when really, you know, even when we look at funding streams, I mean, they're separate, right? When we really should be looking at things more uh, integrated. And two things you both said that I wrote down and kind of made a connection. Um, you mentioned, you know, like bridging resources and, and uh, you know, you mentioned that, Noel, and you said you mentioned the silos. And then we talked about the, um, uh, both uh, academia and kind of workforce being separate. So, and then when we add that or, or um, kind of cover that with, with the equity lens, um, we know that there's a lot of work we need to do here. So from a policy perspective, when we talk about equity, um, you know, and we talk about um, kind of bridging these systems together for the betterment of our young people, which will also support the economy. What are some implications that you all noticed or you felt like, you know, for us to do this as a country um, from a systems perspective, these are some of the policy initiatives or implications that will be necessary? Yeah, I'm gonna let Lizette start that she's the Nina Simone of policy, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I think I think one thing that that Noel said that I that are I don't want us to ignore yeah. is that we brought the international component because we're using an example of what America is calling as innovation. That means moving towards apprenticeships, right? Mm -hmm. Moving towards federal and state subsidized apprenticeships as a way to make sure that we get people into the workforce and living meaningful lives, right? Being part of the economy. What we pointed out is that these policies exist in a context, and a context of a refugee crisis filled with xenophobia says that even the best idea is tainted, right? And so we have to think about what does that mean in the environments we're in right now too. So I think that, you know, when we're talking about higher ed and workforce working together, right? If we're expecting them to up the ante on support for students, but recognize that they're working too, I'm giving an example of that, then they have to recognize where they haven't been doing that well, right? And then they have to recognize where they bring in other partners. So if you wanna have a system like this, it is going to have to be state driven with state support and multiple partners. Is that more complicated? Yes, it is. But what it is, is that it allows more people and more players to potentially put forward a much better face of equity for that young person we're trying to give opportunity to. Because right now we say you have one place and it's schools. And if, they don't, if they're not equitable, then that's it. You're in trouble. We're saying no. Actually, they have multiple contexts that they have to be in, multiple frameworks and lenses that they have to apply to the world. Why not have these partners engaged earlier on in their lives? And so that, that has to be incentivized because right now, structurally, as you pointed out, it is not incentivized. Actually, it's discouraged, right? So our policy platform is saying, how do we make sure that they work together? Right? How do we incentivize that? How do we include quality and encourage the uplifting of quality intermediaries like a co-op or others, right? That do work, that can do that. Because let me make it clear. When I'm saying that we don't want trade-offs, you know what, guess the best, the best workplace environment or, or, or project-based work that Noel may be suggesting may not be run by a teacher. It may actually be with a technology partner with a school that is giving them hands-on opportunities that a teacher may be a facilitator, but not teaching in that, right? That is not, so what happens is that partnerships have to allow people to let go of control. The education system has to let go of some control in order to allow other partners to do more to prepare young people for the economy. So that's, but that has to be policy driven. Noel? Right. right before you hop in, Noel, I just wanted to thank um, Lisa for that piece, because one thing I learned, and it also came across in your text, you know, and, and I think, you know, the Swiss believe that there are certain things you can only learn on the job and mm -hmm. some things that you can learn in, in the school context. And so that that's a really important piece. So thank you for highlighting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Noel? yeah, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. I mean, you know, the thing we, you know, we also wanted to do, and this is just, you know, 
this, this multi-context experience is coming to light right now in this crisis we're in. Yes, it is. Right? It's, you think about the social determinants of health. Yes. It's on full blast right now, right, with COVID-19. And so, you know, in some cases, you know, I, I use this carefully when I think about what Lisa just highlighted is that, you know, the, the, the way in which this pandemic is hitting cities and parts of this country it's hitting differently, right? We know that, and but it's hitting increasingly tough for our communities, right? It's just, right, so it highlights, shines a light on the conditions that we live on, inequalities, right? And it's not, so we can't say it's a, you know, even though people refer to it as the black death and all this other stuff because it's affecting our communities, it, you know, it affected, you know, Chinese folks, it affected European folks, right? It affected all kinds of people around the world, but it hit us and it, but, statistically it's hitting all the poor countries in similar ways, right? Brazil is sort of on deck right now. So what does that mean? What, what does that, how does that relate? It means that in some cases, many cases, what we are also pushing for, and we do this in the book is like, how do we begin to think about what does flourishing look like in different ways? What are the metrics around that, right? So we, 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 could, we have prescriptions that tend to narrowly focus on specific outcomes. And we see this in this pandemic Folks are like, we can ease up on cities and open up the economy as long as we see the metrics around people living, hospitalized, right? And in some cases, what's powerful about that is that you start to see a real dialogue going on, you know, people before profit, right? Yeah. So when we think about it and we think about our young people, it's always been about the outcomes and it's always been about what they produce and what are their achievement levels. How do we think about the flourishing? What are they living under? What are the conditions? How do they best take care of themselves? One institution can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why you see this discussion on jobs or businesses, schools, right? Transportation, housing, all this is happening once because we realize all the time that these things matter, but we had very narrow ways of showing how young people are thriving or not. And so what we're proposing in this is to say, okay, well, let's look at different contexts. Let's see what's happening abroad and, and, and internally. But we also got to be more courageous to think about the ways in which we push policy, push practice to make sure that we are seeing the thriving that we want to see. So yeah, giving a job over the summer is great. We need that, right? You can't cut some youth employment. But let's also make those jobs of quality. And let's have metrics around quality because it's not just getting the income, which helps families, but it's also about the quality of the experience a young person has to be able to flourish, not only short term, but long term, right? Do they have access to the things that they need in those positions? Are they in safe conditions, right, when they're working? Those are things that we are now, I think, on full blast trying to figure out. And we were trying to, you know, in this book also really pushing that through this framework, but, yeah. you know, we still have work to do, but I think it relates to, we got to be much more expansive and courageous about how we're designing policy, but also how are we measuring what success and impact looks like. And you know what's interesting, because I will add another piece on this, Noel, you sparked it, which was right now, especially in thinking right now during the pandemic, there, what I hear often, and I've heard this from people very close to me and say, I know you're passionate about some youth employment, but it feels self-indulgent. People mm -hmm. are not working. You know, adults are not working. And again, the binaries, right? Mm -hmm. Choosing one over the other, right? Let me tell you, it would have been so simple to get PPP money and say, maintain your introductory internships as mm -hmm. part of this. Would have been so simple, mm -hmm. right? Again, the idea that young people and young people's work is indulgent, which is not true, that it is not a value added to families. Think about first gen families, you see that all the time. Working class families, that's, the, that's not the case either, right? So this idea is we're dealing with right now. So I say, what, what happens in a crisis like this? What happens in a crisis is that prioritization happens on race, happens on age, happens on gender, right? And young people are being caught out. And that is why when people wonder what's happening in the summer, we're gonna see the frustration and what it means to truly be disconnected because we did not, provide opportunities for young people that we could have. We could have used this as an opportunity for innovation to say, everybody, all the young people out there are digital natives already. 
why couldn't we push our boundaries and say, what could be an interesting digital native, you know, kind of internship or something like that to do? And we lost that opportunity. I think that there's going to be opportunity for new players. What I'm going to say is government did not provide that opportunity, but I do think that we're going to have some entrepreneurial energy that's going to have to provide that opportunity. So thank you both. Thank you both for those very comprehensive answers, because I think when we, you know, and, and putting on my kind of direct service hat right now, um, speaking to the points you mentioned, you know, working in public private partnerships, I think one of the things that that we're seeing is that, you know, when we switch from a physical to a virtual environment, you know, not all of our young people have access to technology, right? So now when we look at funding and different things, how are we talking about it, both from, you know, the big P and the little P in terms of policy and, and, and what, are, what are the decisions that we're going to be making um, to really support that young person's learning? Also from leadership perspectives, and this is the question I wanted to ask you all, what should college presidents be thinking about? What should employers be thinking about um, as we approach kind of this next phase of the unknown? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start with something, you know, um, for the top tier colleges, they have endowments and it's going to be a blip on the screen right now, right? And I will say this for any of the colleges of privilege, it, innovation sometimes has to come out of scarcity, not necessarily out of having a lot, right? So it depends on what the profile of the environment of that college is, right? Some colleges out of scarcity or out of need to produce something can create something good. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of second tier colleges trying things that we hadn't seen before because scarcity will be driving that innovation, right? Think of our top tier colleges that have not even put out a statement of what they're gonna do in the fall yet. That means that they, they're not that worried. They're gonna figure it out, right? I just, yeah. so this is, look, I'm, I'm just, I'm not reading tea leaves, I'm just speculating. <laughs> but, um, but I would say, so when you say what are colleges, so I actually think the middle tier colleges are going to be able to be creative in ways we hadn't thought about. I'm hoping that. So, and, and some of that is because it's out of pure survival, right? So that's one. And, and that is where we can be opportunistic policy-wise and say, what, what does that look like for them, in a way? Um, so people may be open to partnerships because of that, and that could be some interesting things that may be happening with workforce that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So that, that's just my prediction on, on some of college. And it relates to the book, because the, the, what, what we didn't get as into we talked about the context, but we didn't talk about how conditions can shift mm -hmm. and when some of these policies can be accelerated or become that much more um, attractive and ripe for implementation or for lobbying or for engagement. And I actually think that some of these policies can work for the middle tiers in ways we hadn't thought about before. Thank you, Lisa. Oh. Noel? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, you know, and what's, what, What's also powerful that I you know, see emerging right now and relates a lot to what we did through our research in the book is that you know, young people, again, going back to the agency question of, of point, you know, young folks are really questioning as consumers of education. What, yes. What's the price tag? What's the value? Um, and also thinking about proximity differently, right? Meaning how close to stay home. You know, Looking at CUNY's numbers, there's more students who are, you know, opting out of, uh, you know, second tier schools that may be away um, and opting to stay close to home, going to the community college options or, you know, deciding to go to a four year CUNY because they realize they don't want to be away from their family. And that's big in communities of color when you think about sort of just issues, around, you know, right, being close to home, especially in this time and all the numbers we're hearing around death rates. So there's a lot of things that are emerging around around that. And the other thing, too, is that people are questioning the value of the degrees now, right? We always, yes. you know, it, it just, what, what am I buying, right? That's a big question. What am I buying? What am I paying for? And is there a return on my investment in the market, especially as we see some of the challenges around, you know, jobs and layoffs and things like that? So there's a real questioning around, you know, how do we best get to the consumer, who are the students and families and real questioning about what is the what's the value add what's you know and that's that's an empower, empowering place to be yeah 
because the options are many for a number of our students and many of them going to public institutions, you know, and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd add one thing on that too, is that we've, we're also in a place of the grand experiment in ways we had not been, that had not been before. So for the first time, we're actually truly testing in open admission schools, in high schools and others, what does it mean to work online? What does it mean to do education online, right? And I say that that can also impact also where someone could work, the flexibility, those kinds of things. I don't think people want to give up. I think there's going to be a core group of people who through this exposure may not want to give it up. I think a lot will want to, but I think there is a core group. They've just built a larger population that feels like, why was I taking that commute for how long? And why did all of a sudden all the work I was supposed to do in school be put in four hours, right? I think it's an interesting, I think that what it is, is, is it's adding the return, it's a deeper question on the return on investment, but also how, how do they want to consume education yeah. now became much broader by default. Awesome. Thank you both. And, and this is a great uh, segue because it was a question that I had for you all in it. You know, reading the, 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 the text also, um, this bubbled up for me, um, you know, it, with co-op, many of our students, and it's exactly as you both mentioned, you know, uh, according to the National Federal Reserve, 57% of recent college graduates are unemployed or underemployed. And when I know you both know, but for our listeners, for uh, when I mention underemployed, these are young people that have their degree. They've done everything that we've told them to do. They've gone to school, they've worked while they're in school, so maybe they weren't able to do that unpaid internship because they needed to get paid, which is a whole other issue we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and they now have the degree and they find themselves working you know, in retail or you know, working as a barista. And this is not about job shaming, right? We, we need folks to, 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 be, to, to support our economy, but that's not why they went to school. Uh, and so they find themselves in these situations. We also know that the data says that, uh, you know, 67%, so two thirds of black or Latinx recent college graduates are unemployed or underemployed. So it's a real problem. So when we're talking about the proactive measures, um, which you all mentioned, the thing I really like about the book is you speak about it throughout the whole continuum, right? And co-op is a piece of that. Um, so my question is, you know, one of the things we realize is that now you have this young person that they have the skills, you know, they have everything that they need, but they don't have the social capital uh, to really meet uh, these employers or, or you know, even uh, gain entryway into the workforce. Um, so my question for you all is, what were some of the models that you saw, and especially earlier on, right, because we're more, co-op is kind of coming uh, a bit after the fact, right? They've gone through the system, so to speak, and now they find themselves underemployed or unemployed. Within the K through 12 system, uh, Lisa and Noel, what are some of the things that um, systems can do to really help our young people, especially um, the demographic that, uh, that, that we're discussing, really to uh, build that social capital uh, so that when they do go to college and they, they kind of go through the system, that they're starting to build those types of networks that are going to support their economic uh, trajectory, upward trajectory. Good question. Yeah. Um, you want me to jump in this one? First? Yeah, that'd be great. Right. Go for it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, so um, before, you know, thinking about models, what, what, I, what I would say is that my experience working with um, young people of color and looking at this nexus between school and work, um, mostly these were secondary level students, a few things emerge here, right, when it comes to issues around social capital, as you bring up. One is that I think we, on one level, when we think about job opportunities, we also have to address within this job opportunity structure, job discrimination, right? And what does that mean for young people to navigate environments? If you think about most of the jobs that are available to young people, there are a couple of things happening. One is that, you know, a lot of things that were entry level open positions, and we know from the research that any kind of work that is of substance for a young person to do early on, particularly the populations that we're concerned about, about black and brown young people, is going to be a quality. It's going to be helpful in their trajectory, I should say. That's right. What is also coming up is that um, we don't talk enough about labor discrimination and the ways in which young people try to access work and don't get it, and how that is can be debilitating. So when we say let's just open up opportunities, we also have to check in that those opportunities 
even in places, right, it's also a spatial issue, right? Some jobs are not available inside your community because in some cases you're competing against older adults. And for positions, whether it be checkout counters or selling t-shirts, those jobs are now increasingly, um, the employers are favoring older workers, right? And also more senior folks, if, if they're going for those positions because retirement is, is as quick and as you know, beneficial as it used to be, right? People are working longer, right? So those jobs, it's being crunched. But also, we also, so that's one level of it, but then also discrimination around what does it look like to come from a neighborhood based on your zip code and not get access to those jobs right. that aren't in your neighborhood. So that's one level of it. So I do think there needs to be some addressing of that in the way in which we provide greater, one, discussion about that in programs around what is the navigation required. That's the social capital. Doesn't mean that you won't get discriminated against, but I think good programs that talk about what does it mean to kind of present yourself, be the best you can be in this, but also understand the conditions that you're facing, right? Don't explain them away. Tends to be kind of as what young people are saying is really powerful for their experience. That's one level. The second thing I think is really important is that we also, and you know, Lizette does a lot of work in this as well in her research, is that you know, young people already have a work ethic that's ingrained in them. Yes. And so we, we tend to think them as, of them as empty vessels, right? So when we think about what I just mentioned around how to get them ready for the workforce and, and for the labor force, we also don't take into consideration that they already have early experiences. And as Lizette talks about in her work, early memories of work, right? That we think about blue, pink, white collar jobs. Every person of color who arrived to these shores worked. Yes. Right? Either for free, mm -hmm. with some pressure, Right, everybody worked, and the women always worked. Right, so the glass ceiling phenomenon is a relatively new experience when it comes to women of color because women of color always work, and right, in our families, and you know, and just from experience in history, right. So it's it's a different different challenge on that. So what I go back to on that is to say that there's enough generating from the young people themselves to understand the value of work and what it means to be able to navigate multiple spaces. They bring that. They also know what hard work looks like. Schools, fair employment come out of these communities, right? So that's one thing. But I do think K through 12, as we talked about, can do a better job with adjusting its own model for how better to serve, right, young people. What does it mean to think about seat time differently? Mm -hmm. what, what, you know, do you have to be in a classroom for eight hours a day with information being kind of given to you or do you need to be in a space where you're actually working and um, spending time in a classroom environment? Um, those, so those are examples of it. What does it mean to have um, employment where we know vast majority of young people are either seeking work or working while they go to school? We have evidence of that as early as middle school. We know that's happening in high school, right? Over 40% of high schools are working. And you can almost double that when you think about the college level, close to double that when it comes to college level. So what does it mean to change the nature of the design around work-based learning in school environments, right? And there are a number of different schools that are pushing on that, you know, and I would say even on a fundamental level is, goes back to this question around, you know, what is it sort of college for all approach, which we talk about in the book, which is this idea that work comes after all of this education. And we're saying that we know that you work during your education, that in fact, it's a driver work is a driver for education versus the other way around. And I would say that how do we begin to think about a model that is ultimately considering, you know, how do you actually balance the two, right? So the scheduling, what does advising look like for young people who are going into, you know, not necessarily going into college right away, but they're going into the workforce, right? So how do you train college advisors? Those are models that are there. And so there are a number of different um, models that are out there. I mean, I've been a big, big fan, um, you know, I've said this in a different forum, you know, like Genesis Works, I think Genesis Works is doing Absolutely. incredible, powerful Absolutely. stuff. Um, bold. Very bold with high school very students. Huge, right? We, you know, labor force, you know, we don't touch the young people, right? We wait till they're 18 and above, right? But they're really focusing on that high school model. And so they're kind of, you know, for me, kind of stand out for their really, I think, courageous, as you mentioned, but also they want to get the same kind of internship, elite internships and experiences that we give to better positioned, better resourced young people, um, yeah. families. So that's just one example. 
Thanks, Noel. And before you hop in, Lisa, I just want to say, Noel, you dropped a lot of nuggets there that <laughs> I think are really important. And I just want to thank you for shouting them out um, because you they, they were, it was very multi-layered. And I think sometimes folks speak about this very one-sided and we can't, when we talk about our young people and what the supports that they need throughout the system, we have to speak about it more comprehensively. So thank you for that. And Lisette, I just wanted to tee you up for this because uh, and segueing into, um, you know, or, or uh, piggybacking on Noel, I want folks to know that the, the, the research that Noel um, highlighted that you've done um, has also, it's, it's groundbreaking and it's also award-winning. Um, and I know because I was very close to it um, in terms of watching you go through the process, you really went around the country. Um, to hear about and learn from young people about their experiences. So I would love for you just to uh, kind of highlight that a little bit and, and how that was influenced, because uh, it definitely is here uh, in, in, in the text. Great. So, so I want to say a little bit about models, and then I'll go into that. And thank you, Randy. You were a critical part in, in, in supporting um, the research. So thank you. Um, one of the things is I, I wanted to thank Noel because one is there's a piece of this. Uh, first, the first piece starts with the, the critical self-examination, right? And looking at what is high school, right? What does seat type mean, right? But I would, I would go even more to a place of saying, we know for high schoolers, the last few weeks of June are useless. Now, maybe I shouldn't use that strong term, but maybe I should. No, you're and, right. And what if around the country, everyone would adopt a high schooler and bring them to work with them? Mm. And everybody knew from Juneteenth, right? Think about that. Think of the mm -hmm. symbolism of all of that, that we believe so much in youth power, yeah. that we would be exposing young people to that. In a way, for two weeks, the country knew that high schoolers would be involved in work. I just say that as an example of what does it mean to walk your values. I do think that, that those are examples of opportunities that we can do. I think so many times, and why I love Genesis Works is because they push the boundaries on that, but we could be doing that in a way, even if it's two weeks of exposure, we know what a difference that makes for a young person and yes. how they think about it. And I think June is a, is a wasted month in those opportunities. So I'm just giving an example of what could be a rallying cry that we could do. I mean, I would be happy to take five high schools and put them to work for two weeks and say, because I know what that would mean. But what would it be for organizations as far as liability and the like to, to be able to do that? So that would be a state engaged intervention. And that's one of the policy things we have. But that's an example. I would also say, too, there's another self-examination at the college level. And that has to do with the young people we're talking about, particularly the Pell recipients, more low income, working class young people we know that there is student aid or as we say kind of worker aid that we have there right i'm forgetting the term right now for it but obviously i remember it well the challenge is that when you look even at the jobs that the schools are providing some of them are even the they're having them watch teams uniforms yeah. they're having them work in the cafeteria Right. So even when we think about how a college is thinking about kind of student workers and student aid workers, they're the level of self-examination to look beyond themselves and think about a career track for someone is very rarely taken on. In fact, it's become more internalized. So that's another example where we've missed an opportunity for self-examination. What would that look like if we said they could partner with co-op, which is a wonderful example and say, this is the amount that's going to come from the federal to cover them, and the private company will pay them this extra to match that amount, and their student aid, they could work for 20 hours or 10 hours a semester, and these kind of ad agencies. I'm just giving an example, right? I think you've just rewritten the federal work-study program. Right, exactly, right? But I'm saying, but that's an example of when you say, what does self-examination mean? What could be, and that's why I said we have to think beyond the current models now, because right now, we do not our values are not showing that we care about the career pathways of young people. Because we have the opportunity, we don't, we're not showing it, sorry. No one's convinced me of that. And I do, so, and that may be a little harsh um, because some people, obviously many people still do. Now, when I think about the work that I've done particularly, I'm, I was really interested in this notion of, we talk about the many different 
<laughs> what she said. <laughs> Did I really do that? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we're gonna have to edit that. All right. So, <laughs> when, no. <laughs> or maybe not. We'll figure it out. When I think about the research that we're doing, particularly around, um, I think about all the different identities, right? And think about what does agency mean? What goes into someone really understanding their sense and self of agency? their sense of agency, the confidence, the way that they're gonna navigate environments, what gives them that, right? And there are multiple parts of their identity that uh, reinforce a sense of agency. And one is work, but we never talk about this worker identity piece. And we often think about that as only for older people like ourselves, where work is part of our identity. We never think that it manifests itself younger. And what we were able to show through the research is that it does. In the work that Noel talked about, you definitely see it manifest itself as early as middle school. And it actually reinforces how they engage in, with school and with other people. Well, what I was able to see is that a high work engagement model that also has a high academic model really worked well for young people. In fact, they did better academically than they would have than traditional freshmen. And that blew me away because it said, worker identity, if we actually look at this as an identity, along with the other identities of young people, how differently would we construct the environments and spaces for them, right? And that's why when you say, how do I think about what are different models? That's how I think about different models because I'm thinking that's a key part of their identity. And yeah, there's a piece of it that's regard related to my positionality, right? So which is, yeah, work for me, I couldn't imagine not working. And some of that had to do with too, it was in work where it wasn't about me always being the only one, yeah. right? That's so true, that's true. Right? And, you know, and, and, it's, and Lisa, what you bring up too, is just like, we talk, we talk about it all the time when it comes to our young people, you know, we, we, we look at it in the negative side, right? Around right. like, should they be tried as adults with our incarceration system, right? And right. what does it mean to, but we never look at how childhood is different for our young people. That's right. Right, and you look at any other country in the world, there's always a question of like, you know, sibling care, kinship care, all this stuff that happens in our communities. And not saying that that is the driver of how we should be thinking about providing opportunity, but for young people, we ex they experience things differently based on their context. But we also know in this country, you know, and I say this carefully, you ain't gotta vote, but you gotta work. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? That's the deep thing is like you can choose, right? And, and, and so you have, have the option and some people actually are prohibited from voting, but you got to work. It's a survival thing, but we still kind of devalue that and see that as a, not as a rite of passage for childhood, yeah. right? We, you know, for all of our students, we, we see it as our young people, we see it as only for some, right? So I just, you know, I think that's a powerful piece that you're bringing up on this identity. Yeah, and, 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 and I would say this, and we've probably all experienced this too, we infantilize young people. Right, yeah. when we're thinking of under 18, we infantilize them when they're making probably the most adult decisions ever. Yeah. Right? And so we acknowledge it in one way, and then in another way, we're really ignoring it. And so think about the messages we're sending to young people, right? It's yeah. classic. You're gonna vote, but how come you weren't civically engaged? Well, we didn't accept their agency to be civically engaged, right? Like it's an interesting so and and but that has a lot to do with the work piece too. It it is. And maybe that's what it is. It's, it's, it's our self-examination as adults yeah. on what does our romanticization historically of what we believe should be childhood. Yes. You all are hitting on so many pieces. I want to jump out of my chair, but I, have, I want y'all to see what's on the lower half. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do, you know, I, kudos to both of you for highlighting those points. You know, as a practitioner, I think the one thing, and I've shared this with both of you, but I want to share for our viewers, you know, is that, you know, I've always had a problem with, and, and Lisa, you hit on this with the pathways, and Noel, you talked about it as well. You know, why, if I'm a, a, a young black or brown person, person that lives in a lower income neighborhood, do I need to pick my career in fourth or fifth grade, right? When um, those uh, who are a little more economically privileged um, have the opportunity, it's a nonlinear path, 
And I think sometimes we're pushing um, our, our young people into these uh, pathways that do not set them up for success. So I think there's so many, so many things here that um, I, I think uh, need to be approached and talked about on a very real and authentic level. You know, I would love and know if you could speak to that piece because you talk a lot about young people um, expressing themselves and trying on different identities. And yet we, we get very uncomfortable with that. And yet it's such an important part of development. If you want to, you talk so eloquently about that. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> That's Randy, right? <laughs> I was waiting for Randy. I was like, yeah, Randy, you talk about it. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so, I'm so glad we're going to have some bloopers that will change over time. But, yeah, but, is, but I do think, I think there is that piece is that where, look, the idea is that we are constantly recreating ourselves. That is the American dream, right? The American dream is not just you work hard, you do. The truth about the American dream is you can recreate yourself. That's what we've seen more than anything else. The Horatio Alger is a myth. Not everyone will get there, but one thing people will get, even if they are, have the least means, is that they can believe that they are something else. They can create other notions of themselves. And I think that is really um, an American piece that I think we should leverage to our advantage and understand that in young people. And that's why allowing them the exposure early to work um, is a healthy way of examining those different identities. So they don't, we're not telling them at the European model by fifth grade, what you're gonna do the rest of your life. Right, that's right, that's exactly and, it. I'm, I'm really happy, Lisa, that you brought that up. And you know, something that I've learned, not just through the text that both of you have written, but through your uh, lived experiences, you know, is talking about this divide. And one thing that we're seeing at co-op um, and you all both mentioned it, you know, our, our young people, they are talented, they have the skills, and we choose to approach it from an asset-based lens of they just need the opportunity, they need the, the connection or the access. Um, and so one of the things, and you mentioned, um, and I wrote it down, Noel, about labor discrimination um, that we find is, you know, really putting a face uh, you know, to the employer and, 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 the, and the young person, really getting them to interact together. Um, and I think that that's something that's so powerful um, and you know, really creating that space for systems to be able to do that. Because I think you know, one thing that we're seeing is once an employer is meeting some of our program participants, they're falling in love with them, right? In terms of like, hey, this is the talent that I need in my, in my corporation or my, uh, you know, my place of employment. And so this is something also that I think um, is so important of, of how are we, um, not just from the, the systems perspective, but also in terms of the people behind these systems, really getting that face-to-face that -face interaction. So I wanted to ask you all, um, and it's highlighted here, but would love for you to, uh, to touch on a few, what are a few models where you're seeing that? And I think Genesis Works is a great example. Uh, well, what are some other models where you're really seeing that, um, that kind of, uh, that interaction where that divide is uh, kind of non-existent? Co-op. <laughs> Kalani will be very happy. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Co-op, um, we see it in a variety of places. There's some universities that we, we see that are really built around workforce. So it's not, you know, we see these, these missions that are committed to that. Um, you know, we've all had history and have worked with Year Up. They've done a good job of doing that, particularly with young people who um, are now in community college. But, you know, the question is, what are the other models that are out there, too, that are doing that? I love that this is an area that is ripe and open for innovation. I love that, right? Um, you can't ignore the work that CareerWise is doing. They're trying to do it at a systemic level, um, which is another piece that we were inspired by because it's it's not just about being paid, which they are, but they're also getting credit. And let me tell you, that is the biggest argument that I often hear from people. Well, if they're getting college credit, they can't possibly be paid because that would be like getting too much. Really? Really? I, th that's, I don't understand that. All right? So I'm just giving you an example. Again, the self-examination piece that happens and so of where we find these these old arguments that we need to brush away a little bit. Um, so I would say those are some really interesting examples of what we will see more of. 
um, especially when we're thinking about what does it mean to rekindle an, uh, an economy. Yeah. So I, I, I want to add this to Noel and I were really proud about putting this in the book. We don't believe in a national economy. We talk about that all the time. These are regional economies. Um, the reason why we don't spend an enormous amount of time talking about social capital is that the truth is um, low income people, people of color do have social capital. We're talking about access to different types of capital. And I, I want to say that because this is, we don't believe in the zero sum. Someone yeah. has social capital, the other don't. No, we all have social capital. Mm -hmm. And we have our networks and groups and this great work by Stoll and others who talk about what does it mean to, for black communities that have a level of social capital, how are they leveraging that? What, but what we are saying is that there is structurally an assumption of where talent resides. Yes particularly for well-established companies. And they are interested in finding talent in the most efficient way. So they will take shortcuts. And when they do it by zip code and they do it by school, they are going to miss the students that we are representing. That's what it comes down to. So that's why intermediaries are important to disrupt that, right? That's what we're talking about. Structurally, it's not set up for them to see talent where we believe talent resides. It's just not. And so how do we make sure we shift some of that? And we could do that. They're, they're perfect examples of that. I think JP Morgan Chase, other people are really trying to push themselves to say, how can I do that in a way that really makes sense to build incredible pipelines here with groups of students we never thought about before? I love it. So there is that there, but we just have to remember that out of efficiency yeah. alone, structurally, it, there are blinders to to certain communities thank you for sharing that lisa mm -hmm. so well, what no, no. yeah no it's, it's just it's right on i mean i think you know what um you know what lisette's bringing up also and what you share randy i think so well is that you know we 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 got to bring this down to the human level right which is that how do you build relationships how do you connect people and show as we said talent is right in front of you but you know, there's also from from a uh, kind of a job market analysis part. It's actually what you would do in any kind of smart approach to mining for talent, right? So you think about it. For example, we do a lot right now. The big thing is future of work. Future of work. There's all this BLS, or, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics data on where the jobs are, where they're disappearing, right? Jobs are rudimentary tasks that could be done by machine learning is ultimately going to take over. The, the nexus of where human beings meet with machines is really where the future is and so on. And we have a lot of that information, but we really don't get down to the enterprise level to understand what companies are really looking for and what's the job needs that may be going at some point, but it might not be right away. It might be 10 years, 15 years from now. And what's the pathway that one can take, right? So I think we said, for example, the work you did in Miami around, you know, working with Amex and they needed a bunch of COBOL yeah. operators in plantation in florida and they were like cobalt that's like an old system yeah. like why would you train that's disappearing that's going way of the dinosaur and then you realize it's like wait a minute but isn't cobalt a gateway to other kind of technology and other job pathways so let's let our young people learn that if it is disappearing you know what do we do to kind of prepare them for it so the real work of moving the needle is getting down to the enterprise level. It's really talking to the hiring managers. It's talking to the folks to understand what the trends are and the needs are. It doesn't mean that you don't think about the big stuff, the big trends, but I do think the saving grace for us to get these opportunities is really going to be engaging employers. But it's also important, as we talked about here, is having an understanding of what companies need and also a sense of uh, the young people as talent that is a driver of it, but also understanding how do you develop kind of the career pathways that's gonna to lead to something, right? We have plenty of history with supply side work, workforce programs where we get folks ready for jobs that aren't there, right? And they, or the jobs aren't even you know, open and you get a toolbox at the end of it, right? Um, but none of this is really leading to people having sustainable family wages. So I do think we are in a place right now, if companies wanna to continue to thrive as we talk about, there's a constant need to figure out where talent is, but also how do you get below the trends and the kind of moral panic that we're in right now, which is that we can't plan because we don't know what jobs are for the future. We kind of do know trends, right? But how do we get down to the companies and seeing where things are and where the needs are? 
and using that to drive it, right? So I think there's a, there's like you said, a chance to innovate. There's a chance to be much more engaged, but it's a human element that we already have in place that just needs to be enhanced and people need to be opening the doors more. And companies are smart. The smart ones are opening the doors to doing the stuff. Yeah. Right? They're figuring out talent needs and talking through it and figuring out how to get people positioned and career pathways and investment investing in them. Absolutely. And and for young people, I think what I when I love speaking with companies is that it's what they need now. We don't know what they need in 20 years. We also have to escape the romantic notion that what someone needs now as far as a skill and a tool is going to be what they have for the next 20 years so the retooling the rethinking the reshaping the reinventing is something that we're all going to be doing and the earlier we let our young people know that the better and i always say when someone says oh i don't know what i want to be and i always say to them it's what you want to do first it's not what you want to do for the rest of your life because most likely that may not be the case just by what we're seeing as far as the future of work but we don't talk about that need for that kind of adaptability. We, we still hold on to these romantic notions that this one career is what is going to be the career for the rest of your life. I'm so glad you all highlighted that. I mean, it, it's so important and we do have to adapt to change. I mean, we see that happening right now with COVID. I mean, there were what the need for 100,000 contact tracers. I don't even know what, what that is, right? In terms of what, what that means on the job. And so um, I'm so glad that you all highlighted that, you know, being nimble. And we know systems move a lot slower and we have to be able to build that, that muscle and kind of lubricate the engine to be responsive uh, to, to, to those needs. So that kind of leads me into, I have uh, two more questions. I want to be mindful of time. Um, this conversation's so good. Um, so in terms of if we were to bring it home to New York City, where you're both from, uh, we're proud New Yorkers, all three of us. Uh, so what would be your top three priorities for the next New York City mayor in terms of workforce or a uh, future of work initiatives. And so to keep in also putting in a top context, which you all just said, um, you know, maybe not looking out, you know, for the, the last year of, of his, her, or their uh, tenure, but when they immediately get into office, what would you all mm -hmm. say those uh, top three priorities should be? Good question. Good I, yeah, I, well, first of all, we will have a, a new mayor um, next fall, not this fall. And, and this is actually a great time to really push for some of these things. So one is that, um, how do we think about summer youth employment in a way that it stays very engaged? We can't ignore that. And it would be wonderful to really build much greater national coalitions around that in a way that people get that. Not, and I believe after this summer, people will come back to wanting to see that happen. I'm, I'm concerned about our young people who don't have things to do over the summer, I'm just, just being honest. So that's one. I think the other is paid internships for high school students. I think that's gonna be a big one too. Um, and I also think that having a, uh, a corporate um, round table where the heart of Wall Street for a reason, that really, um, as I always say, uh, pitches the number of internships that they're going to have every year from the public school system. And I think that that can happen. And that may include public higher ed. So there's a way that a mayor in a city like this, which is larger than most states, right, that can galvanize and anchor one of the largest tax base in the country, Wall Street, to do some really interesting stuff. Um, that probably has been done on a small scale, but not as big as it can be. So this is where the innovation happens and the rebuilding economically. We could try some bold stuff. So this is actually the best time to really push platforms for, for young people in, in a way that we hadn't thought about it in the past. So I'm excited about what that could be. Thank you, Lisa. Noel? Yeah, no, I think, you know, that that builds on i mean you know definitely the the um you know expansion of work-based learning experiences for young people I and mean, i think you know as you said mentioned syep you know how does high school um become sort of helpful in driving what that looks like kind of a year-long model right versus just you know just summer employment um is a big one how do we you know that's one major priority i think the second one is has to do with just the thinking about um, what does the school system do around credentialing in different ways and the structure of schooling, you know, not just in the CTE schools, but 
more broadly, right? Ones that are considered to be college prep. How can they be focused on, on you know, work-based experiences? And even, you know, investment in having someone in a school, even if it's a college prep school, who's focused on work-based experiences, right? Who's looking at workforce trends, looking at opportunities for young people in career development, not just counseling towards college as the only model. Um, and then the third one is I think, you know, we had this under Bloomberg in a lot of ways with sort of, you know, just an engagement with the business sector and seeing that, you know, there is, you mentioned these at the round table, but having a real sense of what private public partnerships look like, what does investment look like in schools? How do you innovate with different companies, philanthropy to really begin to augment, you know, school budgets and programs that are supporting young people towards career pathway work. So, you know, for example, when we were in Germany, um, we were fascinated by following a group of young people who went to a library in middle school and all they did in that their program and the library itself had a section and computers designated for young people to explore work experiences and career pathways, right? Very different model from the US, but we found that incredible in the sense of the allocation of resources and the dedication of, of teacher time and the focus of young people to really be in the exploration mode. Um, I, we don't do that early enough. Um, we do that pretty late in the game where we sort it so that students don't have options. Um, so I would love to see on a program curricular level, a real investment um, in something like that. And we have technology out there. We have approaches to it, maybe even, again, as a partnership, you know, linking with uh, companies that could be helpful. I mean, we got Burning Glass, we got Onet, we got all these different folks that chop up data. Could they help and invest in schools, you know, like New York, the biggest market in the country? Right. So and that. Yeah, and, and, and a piece that, uh, that Noel has talked about so often too is how do we reimagine project-based learning, right? Right, when we think about middle school, right? This, the appointment of the chancellor is a big deal, right? And that's a big mayoral platform, right? We think about middle school. In some cases, too old for summer camp, too young to work. What are we thinking, right? How do we create a, an experience that is more meaningful than thinking about it in a way that we thought about it in the past, right? So there is, there is a reimagining of project-based learning. Everyone talks about the need for supported STEM careers. That's the most hands-on work ever. And yet our young people are not exposed to hands-on STEM work. Well, really? So that's an example of where so much of Noel's work could, you know, really, I hope really reinvigorate a mayoral platform. So Noel, get that platform together. <laughs> if anybody can do it, you can. <laughs> She's always putting me to work. <laughs> I love it, though. I love it. Well, you all have shared so many nuggets, and I, I, I you know, I, I, I'll save my my closing comments for the end. But there was something that I did want to share and kind of give a sneak peek because it was very powerful, um, and it was part of the conclusion. And I want to read a piece of it, um, and then I would like to ask you all, kind of, just what. What are, what, what are the things that are most salient for you right now? And it may have not been the same thing that, was, that it was yesterday or the day before that, um, that you would like to leave um, uh, the viewers with uh, about uh, your research and, and any thoughts that you have about this topic. Um, so I'm just gonna read for a moment because this really resonated with me. So the strategies highlighted uh, in the text are not the silver bullet to solving the college and career readiness crisis. They're simply building on research-based and field-tested strategies that are currently making a difference in the lives of young people. It is evident in Working to Learn that the larger policy discourse between a college for all consensus and school to work campaign is out of pace with the lived experiences of young people who are actively bridging the worlds of work and school. Let me snap that up. Uh, policy needs to keep pace with young people's lives. We need an integrated policy approach that provides the best of work-based learning opportunities for young people with, with support services that buttress. Uh, so I just first want to say thank you all. That was riveting to me uh, because everything that I've seen uh, as a practitioner in this space, as someone that's doing uh, doctoral research in this space, as someone that has worked uh, with and learned from both of you uh, over the past 10 years, 
Um, it just, uh, thank you for saying it and for saying it so clearly. Um, and again, just to highlight that piece of, of this graded approach, um, kudos to both of you for, for this uh, awesome piece of, of work. So uh, Lisette or Noel, whoever would like to go first, uh, what would you like to leave everyone with? Wow. So one is, I wanna say, um, I wanna thank you, Randy, because you really represent so much of what this is about, right? Like it's, you, you've lived it, you do it, you're committed to it, you walk your talk around it. And so thank you. So it's, it's exciting to be here. And I'm sure Noelle and I could have asked you a million questions about your work, but I just wanna raise you up right now and just appreciate you because you are going beyond the environment. Um, beyond the silos. And that, that's what makes a difference here. So when I think of my closing, I always think about what, what is the one thing I wish I would have put in the book, because this is what people ask me and Noel all the time. And one is that Noel and I have often served as uh, strategic advisors to different groups, philanthropy, companies, you name it, a variety of places. And one thing is we really help people do an assessment about where they're at when I talk about the self-assessment. So in a way, I wish I would have put an assessment in there for different industries, because I think that could have been uh, an interesting piece for people to kind of say, where am I at first? Um, so I would say that, but that's okay, because you always think about what you'd want to add later, right? But that's fine. Um, they just have to call me a Noel now. That's all that's what it means. <laughs> but the, the other thing that I will add on is that um, a crisis shows us more of who we are, not of what we are not, right? And so, so what do I mean? As we know um, how, what's happening with the social determinants of health, other things like that, and, it's, and I'm saying this regarding workforce, young people are left out of the equation. Young people experiences regarding work, um, being seen as their own individuals with agency that are engaged and committed and supporting their families is being ignored in this process, right? And um, that is troubling. And we have to change that because this is the group that will be taking care of us when we get much older <laughs> and we need to provide the ramp for them. So we've traded off our young people. It's not too late to turn that around. But what it says is this is why we continue to have this discussion because it's so easily traded away, right? Um, I don't hope, I hope that that's not the case in the next 20 years. And I actually think that having all these elections around this time gives us the opportunity to make sure they're not traded away at least in the next four to eight years. So that's what I'll close with. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Lisa always drops the mic, you know. This is <laughs> Um, no, it, it, you know, it's powerful because, um, you know, I, I, I think right now the slogan that we hear the most is we're all in this together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a powerful statement. But as I mentioned earlier, we're all three of us are students of history. I've, I've been in relationship to this book and it comes to young people and to labor. Um, for me, going back into the history of what labor looked like in this country, especially as we reached the 40 million unemployed. I think about, um, you know, my ancestors who, you know, you think about after slavery ended, right? That Juneteenth experience, that 1865 experience. What I was fascinated by was that the folks who were the most involved and engaged with moving from 100% employment, which was slave labor, mm -hmm. to now having to find work with the same people who enslaved you, Right. This driver of work contracts and figuring out how to negotiate that for the best labor wages was the federal government, right, through the Freedmen's Bureau. And so when we think about the role of government in helping to mediate a lot of the crisis that we're in, it's really true. It's powerful, right? State, local, federal. But it was the federal government that really drove it. It was, a, it was really figuring out how to negotiate the best working conditions and labor experiences didn't all work out. We know that that was short-lived, but it was, it was also an important, I think, milestone in history to show what can happen when you think about the collective work that government can have with, at this, in this case, other responsible folks to make sure that we actually 
can thrive, right? And have the best working conditions for young people, the best experiences in their schools and so on. So I would just leave um, it here to say, one, it was a kind of political will, but it was also the fierceness of imagination. Yes. And, and that, that I think, you know, the powerful thing that we have done as communities is we've also had an incredible imagination. We've also had an incredible way of dreaming, right? You know, um, it, it's, it's that powerful thing around what can we do, what can institutions do to really drive the change and take a strategic role in that. And we need that right now more than ever. So young people are ready, families need it, we need it, we all are positioned for it. It's going to take a nexus of different kind of support networks to make it happen. But I do think we have to have the imagination and the will. And I think if we keep pushing and we try to do it in the book, but we, we still have more work to do, but this is the, this is the moment we need, you know, keep saying, let's need a new, a new deal, right? Most mm -hmm. of the best public artwork projects happened during the depression, yeah. right? WPA project, Brooklyn college, where, I, where we went Absolutely. to school, beautiful murals in the library. The library itself is all WPA. So I do all think- public parks. All it's public parks. Conservation Corps, right. That's what, that's what we need. We're hungry for that. So let's, let's, you know, that's what I would say is the next charge. Absolutely. Wow. Well, Lisette, Noel, I mean, it, it's been a pleasure to be here with both of you today. Um, you know, long time, uh, good friends and colleagues uh, in this space and, and personally as well. And I want to tell all the viewers, and this is, you know, my New Yorker coming out. Y'all need to go and get this text. It is groundbreaking. You heard just a snippet of what's behind. I think my little background's breaking up. But this is a, this is a snippet of what you will find in here. Um, and if you need a little, you know, a little hookup, as we say in New York, reach out to Noel and Lisa and let them know. But, but seriously, um, an honor and a pleasure, um, you know, to really just sit here and speak with you all about it and your ideas. And I think more importantly, you know, and this is not a knock to anyone, I think, you know, sometimes there are academic pieces that come out. Um, but you all have been practitioners in the space. You're mm -hmm. scholars in the space. Um, and uh, that's tried and true. And so I think reading that and knowing that also had um, a lot of weight as I was reading it because I knew that your, your uh, suggestions here were also things that were tried and true both through your scholarly research and uh, as your time as practitioners. So happy to uh, kind of evangelize uh, the work that's, that's in, this, uh, in this text. Thank you both. Well, thank, thank you, you. Dan. Appreciate thank you. you. Appreciate you looking all dapper and sheltering in place. Thank you. Absolutely. For really? <laughs> I'm not going to stand up, though. <laughs> all right.